Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us today for our prof talk. Um, I'm Catherine Burgess. I'm president of the Student Honors Organization, and I'm joined by uh, my fellow show officers over here, Rachel and Sydney. Uh, today for our prof talk, we have Greensboro College professor, Dr. Sandra Cook. I had an environmental science class with her several semesters ago, um, which was really fun because we actually like went outside and did things. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> being outside is fun. And I think my class actually did some research with the sap suckers. I think it was sap sucker yes. wells that we looked at. Yep. From yeah. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was initial stages of the project. Okay, yeah. cool. So I uh, am a little familiar with what this is. <laughs> um, but uh, she is back by popular demand, um, presenting a continuation <laughs> of her sap sucker tree use across diverse landscapes a research as education project. Um, Dr. Cook uh, aims to add her undergraduate students into her research. So take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, I'm actually trained as an aquatic ecologist. My graduate work was in rowboats in the Pocono Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. It was gorgeous, it was cold. Um, overall, it was a great experience. So if you had told me back then that I would be all about sap suckers and looking at holes on trees, um, I would be very confused. Um, so I'm going to start off by explaining how I came to be working on this project involving, it actually involves trees a little bit more than it has to do with birds, but it is both. So to start off with, I just want us all to kind of think about how science is done um, more broadly, because again, the way I came across this was not following what you're supposed to do as a scientist. So science, the traditional way. So uh, science, like probably any discipline in academia, usually starts with a, a research question. Um, that research question should be authentic, well-developed, um, innovative, you know, it addresses some knowledge gap, something that needs to be known. And in most scientific disciplines, um, having such a question, while it's exciting, actually answering that question, doing the research, often requires quite a bit of time, money, and specialized equipment. Um, in ecology, and let me just say what ecology is. So ecology, we define this as sort of a subdiscipline of biology. It's the study of the interactions of organisms with their environment. And when it comes to the science of ecology and research questions that are really uh, innovative and important, a lot of the work done nowadays is within the field of study called macrosystems ecology. So as it says here, we define macrosystems ecology as the study of diverse ecological phenomenon at the scale of regions to continents and their interaction with phenomenon at other scales. So basically with all of these global environmental changes happening around us, there's climate change, there's habitat alteration. With all of that, it's become increasingly important to look at things beyond what's going on in your own backyard or your own field site, and really trying to look at these larger scale patterns and how they relate to that smaller scale. And so this is challenging for some of us who really are excited about ecology, we wanna do science, um, but we also love being at a place like Greensboro College, which is wonderful for so many reasons, but you know, we might kind of lack some of the resources that they have, you know, down the road at UNC or at Duke um, in terms of, you know, this million dollar lab and all this grant money and spending full time doing research and not really teaching. You know, that's not what a place <laughs> like this is about. Um, and again, that's OK. But just with that in mind, back in 2012, I became aware of a professional organization called Aaron. E-R-E-N. And I know this is really small to see. So ERIN is an acronym for the Ecological Research and Education Network. And I actually found out about this uh, organization through my alumni magazine. Um, I too am a graduate of a small, predominantly undergraduate Methodist affiliated college called Ohio Wesleyan University. And it was in my alumni magazine where they were featuring this professor who was starting this organization called ERIN. 
And when I saw that and read what Aaron was about, I was like, I am totally on board. So um, as I'm just gonna read what it says here. The impetus behind this project, Aaron, was the growing focus on research among faculty from primarily undergraduate institutions, along with the recognition that many of the most pressing questions in ecology and environmental science are best addressed using multiple sites and coordinated data collection. And it goes on to say, we argue that greater collaboration among predominantly undergraduate institutions will allow these data to make more meaningful scientific contribution. In other words, um, we can get at these macro scale questions if those of us who are at great, you know, small colleges like this combine efforts and collaborate and collect data across a greater scale than we could if, if we were just working alone. Um, and so I, I was totally on board with Aaron because this is a case where we are working on these authentic, important, innovative research questions. Um, and we're able to do this even though we're at a small liberal arts, pri primarily undergraduate institution. Um, what it does mean is that there are some limitations. The projects that we do have to be doable with limited resources in terms of time, money, and maybe in some cases our area of expertise, but um, that's okay because the network, like we are each other's resources. And when we combine resources with all of these things, we can actually get a lot done. And so just a quick example of, um, not getting to the sap suckers quite yet, but another, um, Aaron project that I was involved with uh, before I came here to GC. This was a project that was looking at um, freshwater turtle population. So freshwater turtles um, as a group are a threatened species. Um, about 45% of, of turtle uh, freshwater turtle species are threatened according to the International Union of the Conservation of uh, Nature. And so um, part of this project was to look at uh, like the population dynamics of freshwater turtles. And in particular, the research question that we had was, do the age structures, so like the ratio of juveniles to adults, and the sex ratio, the ratio of male to female, do those things become skewed as uh, the urbanization of the pond habitat increases? So there was this thought that um, ponds that are in more developed urban areas um, might have populations that are a little unhealthy because when you skew the age structure, when you skew the uh, sex ratio, it can you know, reduce um, breeding success, and, um, et cetera. And in urban areas, you tend to have more um, kind of urban predators such as raccoons that can prey on the eggs. And then of course you tend to have more um, roads and sort of um, uh, fragmented habitats. And uh, that can, and nesting females are the ones that tend to be on the move the most. Um, and so that could uh, skew the, the sex ratio. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, what, what we actually did to address this research question is we focused on a single pond. And in that pond, we sampled turtles and we looked at species composition, age structure, sex ratio, and population size. Um, but again, because this was part of the Aaron network, it wasn't just me at my you know, small college, but there were, I think, 26 of us or something like that. So we were spread around the US. We were doing the same project though, the same protocol, the same goal in mind. And um, at the time I was only teaching non-science majors. And so I was a little bit wary of like, can I get these non-science majors to sample turtles with me? Um, and it ended up working out really good though. Um, they might not have been science majors, but um, at least some of them were like all about getting in the pond, putting on the waders, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it worked out It worked out very well. Um, and the project as a whole worked out very well. We were able to um, find some interesting results. We did find an effect of urbanization on the population structure of freshwater turtles. And we have this um, publication in 2018 in conservation biology. It's like a whole bunch of authors because <laughs> There are a whole bunch of us doing the research, but that's okay, right? The more the merrier. Mm -hmm. Some undergraduate students, um, not from my institution, but uh, some research students with, with some of the other professors ended up being co-authors. So um, anyway, this ERA model, like it works really well. It's a, it's a good way to do um, science at, at colleges like this. So when the pandemic came, um, that kind of messed things up, believe it or not. So, um, <laughs> some of the remote learning challenges for field ecology courses. So we all know like there's challenges to all of college, you know, when the pandemic came. 
But for those of us who were teaching classes where we were planning to bring students out to field sites, you know, we had to kind of think of alternatives to that. So it's, it's a problem when your students don't have access to specialized equipment, when um, you're teaching online and they're in different time zones and different, um, all sorts of different locations. Uh, it can be def difficult to demonstrate techniques via remote platforms. Um, when this happened though, the uh, Aaron leadership, so other professors who were uh, part of the, the Aaron leadership boards, they got together in a powwow in the summer of 2020 to brainstorm ways that the Aaron model could be used um, in a pandemic. Um, because even though, like here at GC, we did come back in person in fall of 2020, but there were plenty of other colleges that did not. Um, and even though we were back in person, um, uh, you know, I, I was told, for example, I couldn't have um, field trips, right? They didn't want me um, loading students into vans um, in the midst of the pandemic and driving them all around uh, the area. So I had to think of labs that could be done just here on campus. Um, and anyway, the Aaron leadership thought of this kind of new model or model that's part of Aaron called flexible learning projects. And so with these, again, we're still looking at an authentic research question that can be carried out by uh, uh, professors at small liberal arts colleges with their undergraduates. These are doable projects, um, but the thing is they're flexible. Um, these projects are all things that can be done even if you're teaching, trying to teach ecology online. And so they launched these projects in um, August, 2020. That is the same month that I started employment here at Greensboro College with the task to teach um, upper level ecology. And so I was all about this. Um, again, I was teaching in person, but, uh, but you know, had to think of things we could do on campus. And so um, these flexible learning projects, I, I did like three of them, I think, in, in my class. And it was um, a lot of fun. This backyard beetle and pollinator project was a lot of fun, especially. But um, they also had a call for new flexible learning project proposals. And so this, is, um, this got me thinking, because one thing that I noticed um, on, again, this was my, my new campus. I just started here. And uh, in Bio 1100 at the time, the very first lab that we did was called a tree walk lab, where we'd uh, give students a tour of all the trees on campus and point them out. So to prepare for that, I was giving myself a tour of all the trees on campus and learning what they were. And as I did that, I was like, huh, there are a whole bunch of trees on this campus that have these holes on them that are called um, sap sucker wells. So by my estimate, almost half of the trees on campus, I noticed, had these little holes on them. And um, back then, I didn't know all that much about um, these sap sucker holes. What I did know was that they, were, um, they weren't from insects or something like that. They were made from woodpeckers called sap suckers. And um, I knew, I'd also heard from an arborist I had once met that even though they look like they can be kind of damaging, they don't usually harm the health of the tree. And that was all that I knew about them. But I thought they were kind of interesting and um, like they're easy enough to like look at and count. Well, for the most part, count. Um, but I decided, I, I thought about this. Is there, uh, could there be an interesting, authentic research question here that addresses a significant knowledge gap? So literature research. Um, in my field, Google Scholar is kind of the main database that, uh, that we use. So I did a whole bunch of Google Scholar uh, scientific literature research. And um, I learned a lot. It's really interesting, actually. Um, so I found out, yes, there is some interesting research that could be done here. Um, and actually, I, I, I ended up with like five different research questions. I got really excited about it. And they were all things that could be um, addressed using this flexible learning project model. So um, then this then is what led me to the Sapsucker project. So I um, so a little bit of backstory now on Sapsucker. So one thing I learned was that um, Sapsuckers is actually four different species of these woodpeckers that primarily feed on tree sap. It's the yellow-bellied sapsucker that is the most uh, prevalent here in the eastern U.S. These other three are more kind of west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and again, their foraging uh, leaves behind these really distinctive holes called sap wells. And often they occur in these like neat horizontal rows on the tree or kind of in a, like a scattershot grid-like pattern. And um, this, I was so 
excited about this. You can't really see it well from where you're sitting and with the small screen here, but two weeks ago, yeah, it was like the January 26th, a couple weeks ago, I was walking right over here behind the chapel on this side of me. There's a Eastern red cedar there. It's got like four or five trunks. And this is the tree on campus that has the most sap wells. If you go out and look at it, it's oozing sap and there, there's just holes all over all of the trunks. And I finally caught the little bugger in action. So I finally <laughs> got a picture of sap over there um, working on its, on its hole. So that was very exciting to me. Um, but uh, anyway, in my research, I found out that um, these sap wells are actually really interesting because they um, serve as a food resource access point for lots of other species. The literature says over 40 species like squirrels and hummingbirds and chipmunks and butterflies, they all benefit from those holes. It helps them get into that sugary phloem sap from the tree. And so for this reason, um, sapsucker woodpeckers are considered what we call in ecology keystone species. Now, we could argue that every species in an ecosystem plays an important role, but we call a species a keystone species if, if that role that they play is disproportionate to their abundance. So um, sapsuckers are considered a keystone species because in an ecosystem where they live, they might just make up like a small proportion of the species there or a small proportion of the biomass, but the impact they have is like much greater than that. So yeah, sap suckers are considered um, a keystone species because of the, um, the, the uh, role that they play in providing food resource access to others. Um, another concept here that comes into play is something called ecosystem engineers, which are defined as species that um, influence resource availability by physically altering their, their habitat. Beavers are like the classic example of an of a ecosystem engineer. They dam up the stream, they cut down the wood and all of that. But um, this is also considered uh, ecosystem <laughs> engineering. So pretty, um, pretty interesting role that they play. And I also found in the literature that their foraging habits um, have been linked to, uh, to various factors. So um, previous research suggests that species matters, um, although there's, it's documented that there's over a thousand different tree species that these sap suckers will feed on, but there does seem to be a preference in some areas for um, maples and beaches, I think it is, uh, orientation of the sap well. So in some habitats, most of their sap wells are found like just on the south face of the tree or just the northeast face or whatever. <laughs> Excuse me, which appears to be related to um, the incoming uh, sunlight angle in some cases and the predominant uh, prevailing wind direction in others. So they might be avoiding wind or feeding on like sunnier sides of the tree where the sun might warm the tree and make the flat the sap flow more. So um, I thought that was interesting. Tree size may matter. Uh, I guess that's not too surprising. Like bigger trees uh, might have more sap wells. Bark characteristics uh, seem to matter. And then human alteration. So it seems that um, unlike most species out there, which like, which prefer, you know, this good quality, like old growth forests, if they can get it, sap suckers actually prefer semi-disturbed habitats. Um, and it might be because like the younger trees that you find in disturbed habitats uh, might have like more sap flowing as they're growing. So, um, but, uh, Anyway, the, th this I thought was pretty interesting and there's only limited data on this. And actually on all of these things, um, like the data that supports this was really done on a small scale, like just a university's um, forest preserve that's like a few acres or something. So this is where I thought the significant knowledge gap existed. Like I could do this FLP, this flexible learning project, um, hopefully with other people in the network and we could look at these patterns of, you know, tree use by these foraging sap suckers across all these different, um, this is a map of eco-climatic domains in the, in the US. So do these patterns of tree use vary from, you know, the Southeast to the desert Southwest to the Northeastern Plains? <clears throat> so this then is what led to my research questions. First, how does urbanization, which is sort of a proxy for landscape disturbance, how does that affect sap well occurrence? Um, does sap well occurrence vary with tree species and size across different uh, domains? Are they oriented in a different um, in different directions? Do, does it um, 
the sacral occurrence varied between native and non-native tree species. I won't get into the rationale behind that question, but um, just some interesting, interesting patterns led me to that. And then um, how does sapwell occurrence vary with the distribution of sapwell using species such as the rufous hummingbird or the, the red squirrel? Um, and so I, uh, again, the Aaron was, had this call for proposals for new flexible learning projects. And so I submitted this all, I got it together in like a week <laughs> um, as of starting my new job here at, at GC and submitted <laughs> it and it was, um, it was funded. And um, so that meant that students in my bio 3400 ecology class um, got to uh, do many more labs than they were expecting on sap suckers. So we had at least two field labs and we also had like a data analysis lab too. And I devoted like a lot of lecture time um, to talking about this as well, um, because I really, I needed these students as guinea pigs to help me develop protocols that were flexible, right? Like something that um, a professor somewhere else could look at the materials and say, oh yes, I can teach this to my online students. Um, and so providing, uh, yeah, just the protocols and everything that were doable enough, um, you know, took some, took some work. So that's why I'm thanking these students now because, um, you know, it was, it was very helpful uh, to me when they said, like, step number 10 makes no sense. Um, or when I had students <laughs> who like had to miss lab, I'm like, that's great. You can do this on your own and tell me how easy it was to find <laughs> so, And the, I mean, legitimately, students got COVID and so they did miss lab. So, you know, that that happened. But um, but overall, the methodology is pretty simple. Like you're going out to whatever trees are near where you are and seeing if they have sap wells. Um, and so this is the more this is the list of ideally all the different parameters that participants would collect data on. Um, hopefully you know what eco-climatic region you're in, we're in number two, um, your location. So if you can provide your approximate GPS coordinates, uh, the urbanization level of your area, and then for trees, hopefully you have a way to measure DBH, which is diameter. Um, hopefully you have a way to identify species. For bark type, I had a, um, a, a protocol that students use and, um, when you found sap wells, there were certain ways to quantify them and um, determine the orientation and the texture and all of that. So um, one thing I tried to make clear to participants though, is that this is amenable to data gaps. Like if you're not sure about something, um, whatever data you can provide is still useful for this project. Um, so like when it comes to urbanization, for, uh, urbanization, you know, there's a sort of subjective, uh, you know, uh, uh, identification you can do, like, oh, this area is urban, but you can also be quantitative about it. There's something called the Wardle scale, um, where it's based on light pollution, and it'll give you, like, what class in the Wardle scale you're on. So I had participants do that. That's easy enough to do. Um, for identifying species, I had my students using um, iNaturalist, and I know a lot of my colleagues have their students use iNaturalist as well. <coughs> so this is a really great... Um, app for species identification, and it also uses um, crowdsourcing to help like verify your identification of, of species. So this is actually a screenshot from my class using iNaturalist this past um, fall. So Cameron, he identified his tree, his tulip tree. I think I told him, I said, that's a tulip tree. And so he said, okay, tulip tree. And he uploaded the picture he took of the tulip tree. And then um, uh, shortly later, uh, shortly after that, two separate users on the iNaturalist platform confirmed, yes, that is a tulip tree. And another one, yes, that is a, a, a tulip tree. And so when that happens, you just like gain confidence in the, the identification of your species. And even with wintertime trees, it, it actually does a, a pretty good, pretty good job. Um, for bark characteristics, we used, there's a group in France that's actually working on a, um, on an app, speaking of apps, for uh, for like bark type identification, but it's kind of still in the works now. So this um, this classification um, developed by this uh, forester is is what we've been using for for bark type classification. And then for uh, location on the tree, um, we're interested in is it lower down on the tree, like below uh, diameter breast height, four point five feet off the ground, or is it higher up? Are there sap wells on the limbs? Um, 
There's a study out there that suggests if sap suckers are feeding more on the lower trunks of trees, that makes them more vulnerable to predation. So um, that, that's why I put the, the height thing in there. And then um, for quantity, the idea is rather than trying to count all the sap wells, um, because on some of the trees, especially like the Eastern red cedar over there, there's just too many to count. So the idea is to like estimate bins, like estimate like what category of a, of a you know level that it's at. So anyway, overall, it's it's been a pretty doable protocol. Um, again, my uh, my students um, helped me like hone the protocol as well as some colleagues I have um, from Aaron. And um, these are all pictures from the fall of 2020. We actually collected most our our the 181 trees we observed. You might be thinking, do we have that many on this little campus? But um, we we did a uh, walk to the Green Hill Cemetery just north of here, and that is where we did um, a lot of our observations. There's a ton of trees that have a uh, sap wells there. Um, and so uh, that was like the pilot phase. So in January 2021, that's when I launched the project to the larger network and invited other people to um, participate. And it's still up there now on the Aaron website. Mm -hmm. And um, as of now, 11 institutions have signed on or like expressed interest in joining. And I'm including in this Two weeks ago, someone from Northeastern University in Boston emailed me. She's like, I'm really interested in doing this, but we're right in Boston. Like, I don't think we have any sap suckers here. And so I went on to iNaturalist and on iNaturalist, you can see like a map of observations of anything. So I, you know, looked up sap suckers in Boston and there's a smattering of observations of sap suckers in Boston. And so I told her, I said, well, you know, just last spring, there's like at least four observations of sap suckers in Boston Commons, just north of you. And then I told her, I know Greensboro is not Boston, but we're pretty urban too. And we've got like, I yeah, we, we have quite a few sap wells and sap sucker sightings here. So she decides she's going to give it a try. Um, of those 11 institutions, uh, five have already collected data. Only four have sent in their data. And I know this can be a uh, uh, an issue. Um, I know there are FLPs I have participated in and I haven't contributed my data yet either, so I can't be too um, concerned about that. But the hope is that more institutions will participate and contribute their data. Um, we uh, This project was highlighted in a publication on the overall FLP model, Flexible Learning Project model, that highlighted a bunch of these different projects. Um, and then I've also presented it in multiple meetings and workshops. So I'm hoping all of this will uh, will recruit even more um, participants to the project. Um, but from those four uh, colleges that have contributed data, we have almost 600 observations from uh, three different ecoclimatic domains. <coughs> of those 599 trees, 300 at sap wells, we have about 100 different species that have been observed, different species of trees, um, <clears throat> and also an interesting mix of non-native tree species and um, native trees as well. And um, there do seem to be maybe a little bit more prevalence of sap wells on the non-natives compared to the natives, but it's it's kind of pretty close. Um, and so the main thing is I, I'm learning a lot now about how to tidy up data sets because um, I'm discovering things like you know, for the tree species, the participants only have to give the common name, but like tulip poplar, there's two common names. You could call it tulip tree, you could call it tulip poplar. Uh, there's like four different ways to misspell tulip poplar, apparently. <laughs> and so issues like that, I still got to work on before I can do any sort of um, analysis. But um, <clears throat> that being said, I have done some analysis just with that initial pilot data set of 181 trees. And um, there was a significant effect of um, sap well abundance was significantly higher on the non-native trees compared to the native trees. So that was kind of interesting. Um, Bradford pear is a really prevalent non-native tree in the city of Greensboro. And uh, I, I think I've only found one Bradford pear that doesn't have a whole bunch of sap wells on it. So that, that's definitely a, a tree species that the sap suckers seem to prefer. Uh, we also found, a, well, I'm not sure if this was uh, statistically significant, but it did seem to be a non-random preference for most of the sap wells were on like the north and the northeast face of trees, which does kind of correspond with the prevailing wind direction coming from like the sap, like from the northwest or from the west. 
So maybe they're avoiding the windy side of the trees. And then um, my colleagues at um, SUNY Plattsburgh, <coughs> Dr. Danielle Garneau, who's an ecology professor there, this is like way up near the Canadian border. Uh, she was really helpful in helping me hone the project protocol. And um, this is some of the data her class has collected. So uh, this is kind of, we have a, <clears throat> this is called Arbor Vita. It's like a type of um, cedar tree. We've got one like right over there. And uh, it's just the one we have on campus, but it's it's another one that's like all covered with sap wells. So I thought that was interesting that most of their arborvitas are also covered with um, with sap wells. So yes, it's an ongoing project. Um, I'm hoping we get more data contra uh, contributions and that more institutions will join. Um, but I, even though like we haven't um, really been able to address those research questions yet, we're still of course using it in teaching. So um, I've used it in ecology this past fall, uh, environmental science. We're actually planning to do this on Monday for Monday's lab. Um, and, and like Kat said, I, I uh, did a version of it two years ago in environmental science as well. Um, I'm hoping in Gen Bio, Marge, if that's okay with you, <laughs> that we'll do a lab at the end of the semester. My, my thinking for the Gen Bio class is like maybe using the labor of students to help um, test like the consistency of like the protocols, like especially the, if I can go back real quick to the bark categories that we try to do, um, where was that? Yeah, this, like <clears throat> it's hard to tell the difference between type eight and nine. So if we like send students to like the same set of trees on campus, um, we, I've tagged and labeled and have a database of most of the trees on campus. So if we send them there and we see like, oh, so these students called it type eight, um, and then a small proportion of students called it type nine, this student over here called it type one, they probably weren't looking, you know, maybe you can um, <laughs> let us know like how, uh, yeah, like how useful the protocol is and, you know, consistency in the results. Because that's one thing when you sort of crowdsource science like this, there's always, um, there's always, you have data quality issues that you have to be um, mindful of. So um, yeah, but at the very least, yes, it gets, um, it gets students uh, outside. Um, I see a lot of opportunities for like independent research projects, um, maybe even math. I'm hoping like some math genius will come by and like teach me how to use R or some other software to like more quickly tidy up the data and do some um, preliminary analyses. So if you know anyone, let me know. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's it. Like I said, I wanna once again, thank the students who helped me uh, pilot the project and I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat>